Tonight, the province getting rid of the five-day isolation rule for those who test positive for COVID-19. It's mainly now for all respiratory viruses to monitor your symptoms. Symptoms should be improving for at least 24 hours. And if they have, you no longer need to isolate, according to new guidelines from Ontario's top doctor. More on the changes and why the rules aren't sitting well with some. Plus... They refuse to hear from families and frontline workers who say this bill will be devastating. The Ford government passes its controversial long-term care bill without any public input, with many questions still swirling about what it will mean for hospital patients awaiting a long-term care bed. And... The drug supply right now in Ontario is more toxic than it's ever been in history. On this Overdose Prevention Day, people across the city gather to raise awareness and call on the government to do more to help save lives. Good evening, I'm Kelda Yoon. The province is expanding booster shot eligibility to children aged 5 and up. Appointments can be booked starting at 8 a.m. tomorrow. Now, the announcement was made by Ontario's top doctor, who also announced today that the province will be dropping the mandatory five-day isolation period for those who test positive for COVID-19. Tyler Cheese has more on the new guidelines as well as reaction. For children 5 to 11, access to a booster will be available as of tomorrow. This announcement comes weeks after Health Canada approved booster doses for this age range and just in time for next week's return to school. But it's Moore's other announcement that has sparked a reaction. We've updated the guidance on the, of, on the personal actions that should be taken with respect to staying home and isolating when you feel sick or test positive for COVID-19. Under the new guidelines, people are no longer required to isolate for five days after testing positive for COVID-19. Instead, they can return to work or school when symptoms have improved for 24 hours. The province adding masks should be worn in public for 10 days after the start of any symptoms. This approach should uh, decrease the risk of all respiratory viruses in our communities. But with the ongoing crisis in healthcare, not everyone agrees it's the right approach. You know, I'm deeply concerned. We've got ERs closing, ICUs closing, nearly 1,400 people admitted in hospital right now with COVID-19. Some are questioning the timing of these new guidelines with kids going back to school next week. Now is not the time to really relax. Five other provinces have already relaxed their isolation requirements, with Saskatchewan leading the way back in February. But this local epidemiologist says it wasn't the right move. I don't think Saskatchewan is, um, is a good model to follow. In August, compared to in July, 84% uh, hospitalizations increased and the death rates are holding steady. So um, we haven't moved out of COVID-19 yet. The announcement is also a cause of concern for those advocating for more paid sick days in the province. This is bad news um, all the way. But at least having a, a public health mandated five-day isolation period allowed um, a worker to be able to say to their employer, you know, I'm, I'm sick with COVID and I um, am supposed to stay home for five days. All of this a day before the federal government is expected to announce the rollout of an updated vaccine targeting the Omicron variant. Tyler Cheese, CBC News, Toronto. The Ford government passed its new long-term care bill today, fast-tracking it without any public input. Now, the new legislation is meant to help free up hospital beds, but it does so by allowing hospital patients to be moved to a long-term care home that's not of their choosing. Advocates for the elderly have written to the Ontario Human Rights Commission, saying the bill will result in age discrimination. Lorena Redekop has more. Mr. Colangelo. Mr. Colangelo. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Ford at Tobacco North. One by one, government members vote in favor of Bill 7. With their majority, it easily passes. The ayes being 76 and the nays being 35, I declare the motion carried. The bill amends the Long-Term Care Act, allowing actions to be carried out without the consent of a hospital patient needing long-term care or their family, including admitting them to a home not of their choosing. All his hospitals are struggling, and around 2,400 hospital patients are waiting for long-term care. The government is ramming Bill 7 through today with virtually no debate. They refuse to hear from families and frontline workers who say this bill will be devastating. 
The opposition wants clarity, including on the cost if a patient refuses a home, and whether they could be charged the daily hospital rate of up to $1,800 a day, or the much lower fee they'd pay in long-term care. I can't uh, say 100%, but $1,800 is absolutely ridiculous. Uh, we'll have to work out a cost, and the hospitals have to work out the cost. The people that are determining that is not me personally. It's, it's the hospitals and Ontario Health. So they'll work at it, uh, work it out, but I can pretty well guarantee it's not going to be $1,800. Today, this exchange. Will the Premier make an absolute guarantee today that no senior will be charged that fee? To respond, the Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, it's not about the cost. It's about giving proper health care to people that should be in long-term long -term care. A union and two advocacy groups for the elderly wrote to the province's Human Rights Commissioner, calling for an inquiry claiming age-based discrimination. It'll be challenging court, it'll be challenged at tribunals. You know, th this measure has been hanging around as an idea for 20 years, and there's a reason that it didn't happen. It's unjust, it's unfair, and it's just not right. A lot of people are going to get hurt, we're going to see needless suffering, we're going to see unnecessary deaths. He insists that's not an exaggeration, that deaths due to isolation are a real concern if elderly people are sent to homes difficult for family to get to. The government says people won't be sent a large distance away. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. But so far, there are no details. Regulations to go along with the bill are still to come. Lorenda Redekop, CBC News, Toronto. It's been more than four years since CBC Toronto was first denied copies of Premier Doug Ford's mandate letters. The province has appealed orders to disclose the records all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada. Well, now it also won't reveal how many hours government lawyers have spent on the case. Mandate letters traditionally lay out the marching orders a Premier has for Cabinet after taking office. For years, they've been made public across the country. But the Ford government has been fighting to keep the records secret since it was first elected. And now the province is also refusing to disclose how many taxpayer-funded hours have gone into those efforts. Now, this despite being ordered to by Ontario's Information and Privacy Commissioner. The Supreme Court of Canada is likely to hear the mandate letter case early next year. No hearing date has been set for the new appeal. The province's police watchdog has charged three officers in the shooting death of a toddler. Now, the Special Investigations Unit was called in in late November 2020 after OPP officers shot at the boy's father who is alleged to have abducted his child in the Kawartha Lakes area. The child, 18-month-old Jameson Shapiro, died. His father died of gunshot wounds about a week later. The SIU says three OPP constables, Nathan Vander Hayden, Kenneth Pengelly and Grayson Kappis have each been charged with one count of manslaughter and one count of criminal negligence causing death in relation to the boy's death. The officers are set to appear in a Lindsay court on October 6. A Markham restaurant remains closed tonight after a case of food poisoning over the weekend that sent several people to hospital. A public health says the accidental poisoning is linked to a spice that is believed to have been contaminated with trace amounts of a toxin called aconite. Ali Chiasson has the latest. A popular restaurant remains closed for the time being, much to the disappointment of its regulars. Seem to be packed in there and everything. Most people come here for breakfast and lunch. Most of the time, I come every two weeks or one week. Delight Restaurant and Barbecue has been in the news this week after diners fell seriously ill from a certain chicken dish. It had been cooked with a spice believed to be accidentally contaminated by a dangerous toxin, specifically aconite, aka monkshood, aka wolfsbane, which has been mistakenly ground up and included in spice blends before. In previous uh, uh, occurrence of this, it was contaminated ginger root, but in this case, it's it's uh, another spice with a, with a couple of different names. Part of the ongoing public health investigation is finding and removing all possible sources of the aconite poisonings. While used in traditional Chinese medicine, aconite is not a regulated food product here in Canada. We do believe it's a very, very small distribution network. Um, and in fact, you know, where, where we took it off the shelves initially, I, I don't know the, the, the actual name of that facility, but you know, just a, a couple of packets. And actually we have no evidence that those packets were contaminated either. So what we are doing at the same time is testing 
all of the material we have, both from the food and the spice itself, and from the individuals who became ill. At least 12 people got sick, with four ending up in intensive care. Ingesting a large enough quantity of aconite can affect the nervous system and cause fatal cardiac arrhythmia. While the diner's conditions are now improving, York Public Health, along with the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, says they should know the source by Friday. And that part takes a little bit longer, but I want to reassure people that, you know, this is not something that, that your general public, people who are using spices or people going to restaurants need to worry about. The regulars we spoke with today don't blame the owners. I think just a supplier, just a supplier. In a scene like this, unfortunately, some, some people got sick and they had to go to a hospital, but I honestly, I would, I, I still go back. Yeah. So you'll come back, right, despite all this? I'll come back. That's why this morning I heard the video, they will reopen today. That's why me and my friend come to visit, yeah. to support. They'll have to wait a while longer yet, even though there are some staff inside. We took a peek in. They're not ready to open their doors to diners just yet. Once the public health investigation wraps up and they determine the source of the toxin, that's around when you can expect to hear about potential product recalls linked to this. Ali Chiasson, CBC News, Toronto. All right, let's go to Kim McDonald now from the Weather Network for a first look at your forecast. And Kim, a few showers here and there, but overall a pretty pleasant day to round out the month of August. Keldon, we had a few power showers today, nothing too severe. The severe weather was all in the east where we had tornado warnings in both Cornwall and in Ottawa as well. Uh, just some downpours for us around the GTA. Most people keep asking me for more rain, so there you go. Hope you liked it. But most of the day was sunshine. It was windy, however, windy for everyone, but particularly at Pearson, 65 kilometer per hour wind gust. That was the highest that was recorded this afternoon. We are expecting those winds to die down, though, through the overnight and through Thursday will be much calmer. 20 to 30 kilometers per hour versus that 50 to 65. Not a bad day overall. Lots of sunshine, very little in the way of humidity, but we have clear skies at night, which leads to cooler temperatures. Radiational cooling is what we call it. And the farther away from the lake you are, the colder it's going to be. So. In Toronto, Oakville, 14 degrees, but Orangeville, Guelph, Kitchener, 9 degrees. That is it. Okay, coming up, I'll give you the rest of the week and the weekend, too. Looking forward to it. Thanks so much, Kim. Today is International Overdose Awareness Day, and community organizations from across the city gathered at Seton House to remember those lost to the crisis and to call on the province to do more to help save lives. Patrick Swadden reports. For some, it's a day of remembrance. August 22nd was the nine year anniversary that I lost the love of my life, my best friend and my child's father to an accidental overdose. And for others, a day of solidarity. But together we keep getting better. And it doesn't seem to be going anywhere anytime soon and neither are we. But today, August 31st, is mostly a day of awareness. The drug supply right now in Ontario is more toxic than it's ever been in history. And it seems that, I don't know, people aren't really paying attention. International Overdose Awareness Day brought community organizers from across the city to Seton House to recognize the devastating overdose crisis and remember the lives it's taken. And it can be really hard to find like a, like, like a, a place to, to hold and share like collective trauma and collective grief. And a day like this really like helps bring people together and like remind them of the importance of the work that we're doing and the importance of the community that, that, we, that we live and work in. It comes at a time when over eight Ontarians are dying to drug overdoses every day. Recent data from Ontario's chief coroner puts the number at nearly 2,800 deaths in the province between April 2021 and March of this year. For outreach workers like Michael Birch, what they showcase at community events like these save lives. We want to make sure that people, if they are using substances, that they're doing it as safely as possible and as responsibly as possible. That includes things like naloxone, clean needles, and kits that test for toxicity. But for others, awareness isn't enough. They say more needs to be done. What we need really is, is to make sure that the provincial government, which has purview over mental health and addictions, we need them at the table. We need them out in these fairs. 
In May, the Canadian government removed criminal penalties for possessing small amounts of illicit drugs in British Columbia. Toronto applied for the same exemption this year. Meanwhile, Health Canada says the application is still being examined. Patrick Swadden, CBC News, Toronto. Welcome back. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has made a small tweak to his cabinet. The shuffle was announced today at Rideau Hall. I, Philomena Tassi, do solemnly and sincerely promise and swear. Helena Jasik are switching positions. Jasik is taking over as Minister of Public Services and Procurement. Tassi becomes the minister responsible for the Federal Economic Development Agency for Southern Ontario. Tassi, who is from the Hamilton area, requested the move so that she could spend more time closer to home. Her husband recently suffered two strokes. More than a thousand people have died and hundreds of thousands of homes destroyed in Pakistan after severe flooding that has lasted for weeks. The desperate situation has moved a number of local aid organizations into action. As Greg Ross tells us, they're now working to provide aid to tens of millions of Pakistanis in need of help. At Global Medic, a charity that provides emergency aid to people around the world. <laughs> Volunteers are assembling and shipping these devices that will provide drinking water to thousands of families. This is a point of use water purification unit, uh, gravity fed, no moving parts, no electricity, super simple, you know, to put together. Global Medic Executive Director Raul Singh says these water purification units can save lives. If these kids get acute watery diarrheals or cholera, typhoid or waterborne diseases and they're out baking in the sun because of the heat and they're in these floodwaters and they're already immunocompromised because they don't have enough food and they've been displaced, these kids will die. The situation on the ground is uh, extremely grim. Mahmoud Qasim with the International Development and Relief Foundation has seen the devastation firsthand. He visited some of the hardest hit areas in Pakistan last week. Miles and miles of earth just flattened where the homes have completely been demolished. Families are living in, you know, makeshift shelters that they've created out of whatever they could find. His organization is already working on plans to help rebuild homes in the coming months and years. But for the time being, they are working to keep people in Pakistan fed. We're doing food distributions and these food packages contain rice, sugar, chickpeas, tea, red beans. So a lot of the staples to ensure people that have lost their homes, that have no money, have no food, have something to eat. IDRF is hoping to raise $3 million in donations for Pakistan. So far, they've delivered food packages to nearly 1,000 families. And by the end of the week, Global Medic is hoping to ship 5,000 water purification units. Greg Ross, CBC News, Toronto. The world is remembering Princess Diana tonight on what is the 25th anniversary of the royal's death. Royal watcher Afia Hagen says her impact is still felt across the Commonwealth because of her many charity endeavors. She worked with refugees, she worked with AIDS patients, people who had leprosy. She did the famous landmine walk, things that no royals had done before her. And I think it was her affinity and her compassion that people really had an affinity with. She loved people and people loved her. A memorial was held in Paris today to mark the anniversary. She was killed in a car crash in the city along with her boyfriend, Dodi Fayette. That event was a catalyst and it changed the royal family forever. It was also followed by one of the biggest public outpourings of grief in memory. And you are looking at a live shot of the Toronto skyline. It's mainly clear this evening and remaining clear overnight. Right now, a comfortable 23 degrees in the city. All right, let's go back to Kim now with a look at your extended forecast. And Kim, temperatures starting to get a tiny bit cooler as we head into September. Well, then let's take a look back, see where we're supposed to be on this day. 24 degrees Celsius is our forecast, 23.8 is our normal. So let's call it normal. 33.7 is the record that has stood since 2010. And as far as rainfall goes, 43.7 millimeters is the most rain we've seen on this day. That was back in 1949. And the sun is setting at 7.55. We've lost another two minutes. And that's it for August. We can call it a wrap. By the way, September 1st is the beginning of meteorological fall. Meteorological summers, June, July, August. Okay, so 
This is how many days we had above seasonal in the month of August. Anything you see here in brown, above normal. And that was most days. It's been a hot summer. It was a hot August. There's the trough that went through that brought the pop-up showers through the afternoon. Much more severe weather in eastern Ontario. Clear skies, though. Clear skies through the overnight and then through Thursday afternoon as well. But when you get clear skies at night, yeah, it tends to get a little chilly. But by the afternoon, temperatures rebounding 24 degrees. It's a little cooler than what we've seen of late. Cooler away from the lake too. Orangeville is only 22 degrees. So yeah, it's not exactly fall like, but it gives us a little hint of it, right? In Ottawa, Montreal, temperatures are in the high teens for Thursday. There you go, not a lot of humidity. When 24 feels like 25, that is not sticky at all. This is open up your windows. It won't be quite as windy, but it will be breezy. So comfortable weather. There goes the low pressure system that caused all the issues. Another one is coming. In between, we've got sunshine, but this one could bring some active weather for the weekend. So when we're looking at hours of sunlight, the next couple of days, 11 hours. That's pretty good. Lots of sunshine, lots of sunlight. And then Saturday and Sunday, a little bit less so. And those are our two best days of seeing any kind of active weather. Unfortunately, it's the weekend, but so far, Labor Day Monday is looking pretty good. Okay, I like the sound of that. Thanks so much, Kim. Pop stars getting the honor of a lifetime tonight. Avril Lavigne was given her own star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. I can remember seeing these legendary names and think, and I never could have imagined that mine would be here. This is so crazy. I am so grateful. This is... Probably one of the coolest days of my life. Levine recounted the time that she first laid her eyes on the Walk of Fame when she was just 16 years old on a trip to L.A., telling the story wearing the same sweater decades later. The career benchmark comes as the 37-year-old toasts the 20th anniversary of her debut album, Let Go, which launched her career with the single Complicated and hits such as Skater Boy and I'm With You. We'll be right back. Oh. And finally tonight, Serena Williams' farewell tour has been extended. One of the greatest athletes of all time continuing her Grand Slam run at the U.S. Open. Serena Williams just supreme in the final set when she had to be. Williams advances to the third round of the tournament with a win over the number two seed in the world, Estonia's Annette Kontevate. Now, Williams was considered to be the underdog in the match, with many analysts predicting that this would be her last time taking to the court. The 40-year-old announced her retirement from professional tennis earlier this month in Toronto at the National Bank Open. Now, tomorrow, Williams will take to the court for doubles action with her sister Venus. Hope she goes all the way. That's our show for you tonight. Thank you so much for watching. I will see you back here tomorrow night at 11.